Um, you know, as we, as we continue on in this series, we're in the midst of the Fixer Upper series. Maybe it's your first week here. Uh, this is like the fourth week of the series. I'd encourage you, man, go online. You can, you can go back and you can check out the previous messages. Um, but one of the things we talked about in the beginning of this series was that remodeling looks like a few things in our life. And, and we've kind of um, draw, drawn a parallel between like the remodeling of a house and the remodeling inside of us. And some of those look like this. That remodeling means that we're a mess on the way to being beautiful, right? That God's doing a work in each of us. He's not done yet. Remodeling also um, always includes surprises you're not expecting. So my hope is as you're, as you're listening through this series, you're hearing things that you'd say, man, I didn't realize like that was going on inside of me, but I need to address it. We also talked about remodeling is about counting the cost. And usually it costs more than expected. As I just told you about the parking lot, right? That's exactly what happens. That, um, that a lot of times it, it costs more than we think it's going to, even for us in change and what God wants to do in us. And then the final thing, which we actually kind of hammered in on last week, that remodeling is about trusting the individual doing the work. If you're going to have someone in your house to rip your kitchen apart, you'd want to make sure they know what they're doing. And um, this is the same kind of thing that we trust that God knows what he's doing in the midst of doing a work in here. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. It's actually at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. That doesn't mean we're done, but it's just the passage that um, I felt led to, to share with you this weekend. It says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. Father, thank you for today. I do pray that you're going to help me to communicate this today. And I pray that as I speak, that you can speak to your people around this room. I pray that not be about my words, but I also pray that, um, that, Lord, more than anything, that you would be heard. Help me to communicate your message today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, we've all been given a life that we are blessed with. I said it a few weeks ago that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves each and every one of you. And, and I think what it comes down to is, is what are we going to do with a life that we've been given? You know, and... When I was thinking about this passage, and you got uh, basically this parallel between two houses, right, who look very similar and yet have very different foundations. As you look at the two people in this passage and compare, both start with hearing. If you would read this passage, you would see that both of them says, like, they heard, and then they did different things with what they heard. You know, and, and that's what I think it always comes down to. I mean, it's one thing for even all of us to be in this room, right? But it matters what we do with it what we do with what we hear. In fact, I think, I think I've seen this in a number of families. Maybe you would say this if you've raised kids or you've helped to raise grandkids or whatever it may be. Isn't it interesting that in, in a given family that you could, you could teach the same things, you could discipline the same way, you could love the same kind of way, but two kids like respond completely in different ways. That one kid listens and man gets it and they do it and they respond and the other kid like, mm-mm. You ever had one of those? Right, yeah. They don't listen, and they don't respond the same way, yet they're in the same family. See, I think if you drove through a neighborhood, houses of a given neighborhood, they have a similar look oftentimes. The foundations can, can be completely different. You can look across a church, and, and you know, truthfully, we sit in here, and we're actually, most of us are fairly alike. I mean, we live in the same part of the country. You know, most of us are a part of the community. We're a part of this community, Crossbridge, you know, we, for many of us, we, we read, we pray. For many of us, we're part of a small group. Like, if you looked at the outer kind of things in our life, you'd think, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty similar to the guy who sits next to me. And yet what I know is this, that as much as you may look a little bit like the person sitting next to you, the foundations across this room are all different. That really what is happening in people's hearts, like you may look similar on the outside, but what I was on the inside could be completely different. So what makes for a good spiritual foundation? 
I think the first part is that we would just put ourselves in a place to listen. It, if you look at the very beginning of verse 24, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. You know, I think it comes down, are you putting yourself in a place to listen? Part of putting yourself in a place to listen is even coming to this kind of place, right? To where you're saying, God, I'm, I'm here. I'm giving you an hour of my day. I'm giving you an hour of my weekend. But I expect to hear something from you. And what I hear all the time is he's faithful to do that. He's faithful to talk to you about what you need to hear. I think other places, you know, like we, we talk some about, you know, read, reading the Bible about praying, that those are, those are a couple of the places in which when you're actually engaged in your relationship with God, you have a chance to hear from him. We encourage people to, to join a small group. In fact, we're in the thick of that right now. We have approximately somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 people who signed up to be a part of a small group. And, and we believe that's really important because you're surrounded by people who are on the same journey as you are, and it's a great place to listen. God actually has the opportunity to speak through someone who sits across from you, and you could hear his truth coming through them. I want to tell you something. Um, you know, if you didn't, if you weren't here last week, I'm, actually, I'm glad you're back. I was afraid after I preached last week, many of you wouldn't come back. And uh, it was an interesting subject. We talked about lust. And um, I wanted to do part two, but I chose not to. I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> But I'll tell you one thing I was thankful for, even in the midst of a small group, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I'm a part of a small group that meets every other week, and we do sermon reflection. And I was thankful it was every other week, and it was not last week, right? <laughs> so for some of you, I know it was a rough small group time. <sighs> See, there's a, I'll tell you this. You know, in, first key, put yourself in a place where you can hear from him. I mean, that's what it starts with, just opening your ears to where you can hear from it. The second thing is this, is I think it's actually the back of the passage. It says, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority. Real authority. I think that's important. It says, basically, he, doesn't, he didn't teach like the other religious leaders. That when he spoke, it was with authority. You know, I think one of the things that's critical is, if we put ourselves in a place to listen, that we recognize when he does speak, he has authority in our life. You know, authority in your life comes down to this. You know, truthfully, you are the authority in your life, right? So what happens is you either give him authority or you don't. And, and we know this, like giving him authority is hard because when we give him authority, what we say is, God, I'm willing not only to listen, but I trust what you say to me. Like it's going to be for my good. And I'm letting you, like, look around. I'm letting you check all, everything inside of me. Like, you take a look and you tell me what's wrong with me. And then you help me fix it. That's hard to do, right? But see, we can, you know, you could, you could go for a variety of places and hear good words. I mean, you could find a lot of wise people. You've probably got wise friends. You've got wise family members. I mean, you could go to a lot of places. But I'll tell you, like, like Jesus is not just another place. Like when he talks to you, he wants to be the authority in your life. You know, and then we move on and, and you look in verse 24. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds their house on a rock. And then you go to 26. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. See the comparison? They both hear. One obeys, one doesn't. It says it's like a person who builds a house on sand. You know, here recently, many of you, um, you know, I've talked about this before, but I, I really, I look up to my dad, and he's a, he's a strong voice in my life. And here recently, I was making a larger decision, and so I was talking to him quite often and, and just saying, hey, dad, I'm thinking about this, and da-da-da-da. And, and, and I'll tell you, like, when he speaks, I listen. I mean, I do. Now, it's not to say that I listen to him more than I listen to my heavenly father. That's, that's not the case. But I know this, that, like, number one, my, he's a wise man. And number two, see, I, I, it always, it's, it's, in fact, I think he chooses his words very carefully with me. My dad's actually probably a guy of fewer words, but, man, when he talks, like, listen. And, and in the midst of that, like, I know, like, he, he chooses his words wisely because I think he also knows that I listen. So he wants to make sure he gives me the right advice, Right? 
And, and, and here's what I know. Like, my dad, number one, he, he loves me. I've never had a doubt about that. Number two, I know this. He's, he's like, he's my biggest cheerleader. I mean, if anybody's for me, it's him. And number three, I know he wants the best for me and for my family. Because I know all three of those things, without a shadow of a doubt, never question. He loves me. He's for me. He wants the best for me. See, when he speaks, I listen because, because of those three things, I know I can trust him. I mean, I trust him. His motives are always right in my life. Now, I want to tell you something. I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm blessed to have a, an earthly father like that, and many of us are not. I recognize that. But I'll also say this. See, I think it's important that we would view our heavenly father that way. And when you think about a heavenly father, and some of you maybe, you know, I know we come from all different backgrounds, but I want to tell you this. According to scripture, number one, he loves you. You don't ever have to question it. In fact, it says it's unconditional. Like, we don't even understand what that means. It means it's not based on what you do and you measuring up. He just flat out loves you, even on your worst day. Number two, he's for you. When I say for you, I'm saying he believes in you. More than anyone else, he sees potential in you that no one else sees. He is for you. He's your biggest cheerleader. And number three, he wants the best for you. We've been talking about it throughout the whole series. The reason that he says these complicated things, the reason that he preaches this very difficult sermon is because not that he wants to make your life miserable, because he wants to make your life incredible. He wants the absolute best for you, for your marriage, for your family. He wants the best. And because of that, see, when you think about it, if that's your picture of God, a God who loves you, who's for you, and who wants the best for you, let me tell you something. That means you can trust him. You can trust him. Because when he speaks to you, his motives are right. When he speaks to you, he's speaking out of concern for you. You know, um, here's the hard part. Though. We're talking about obedience, right? See, uh, I, think, I think it starts with how you see him because I think you have to trust him because there's times when he talks to us about very difficult things and to be obedient takes courage. It takes courage. It takes strength. It takes a willingness sometimes to overcome our fears, right? My, my parents were up here a couple of weeks ago and um, I've been actually working on my mom for a long time and um, about a certain subject. And so like the last couple times I've went home, the last couple times she's up here, my mom has this phone that's like from 1999, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I've been saying to her for a very long time, like, hey, mom, like, let's upgrade you to a smartphone. And she's like, uh-uh, no, I don't want to do that. You know, my phone's just fine. And I'm like, mom, you don't understand. Like, if, you, if you'd get a smartphone, like, I could send you pictures of the kids. And, like, like, you would like it. You could actually, like, when you talk on it, it could talk through the car. You know? Like, there's all kinds of advantages here. And she's like, mm-mm, no, no, I'm good. And, and I've tried and I've tried. And she was up here a couple weeks ago. And I had her in the car. They'd just gotten here. And we were driving around town. And I, and I <laughs> turned around and I said, hey, mom, maybe, maybe we should go get a phone. And she's like, no. No, I don't, no, no, I'm not, not yet. And, and I drove around a little longer. I was like, Mom, I'm telling you, like, just trust me. You're here for three days with me. I'll show you how to use it. She's like, no. And so you know what I did? I drove around, and I just, I drove over. I pulled in Verizon. <laughs> I pulled in, I turned around, and I said, we're going to go in, and we're going to look. I'm not forcing you, but we're going to look. And my dad's like, yeah, let's go look. I knew. It was his subtle way of saying, let's do it, but he's trying to ride the fence, you know? <laughs> so we go in, we look, and she's, you know, she, she'd never even typed on, like, a keyboard, you know, like on a phone. And so that was challenging. And, um, and I was watching and trying to help. And, and, and long story short, you know, we, like, she left with a phone. <laughs> and, and I got her this, like, monster of a phone that's easy to type on. And just fits in her purse, you know. And, and so, but even, when I, even when we left, she said, so I'm like, how long do we have? Like, can I, can I bring this thing back? You got 14 days. I mean, I knew she wasn't going to take it back, but it was comforting, right? She could get her old phone back. But I'll tell you, so like she, she got that phone and we worked on it, you know, and I trained her for a few days and then I sent her home with it. 
And like ever since, I've been taking pictures of the kids doing everything. You know, Gerald's eating his Fruit Loops. I'm like, smile, buddy. And then I send it to grandma. And she loves it, right? She loves it because all of a sudden now she's got like a window into their life. She's figured out how to save all the pictures. I know she's showing people. It's awesome. And, and, and every time I call, I'm like, how are you doing with the phone? Doing fine, you know? And, and I'll tell you this. Like, see, that phone, one of the things I talked to my mom about was, mom, like, I know you're scared of the thing. Like, you're just scared of making the decision. But I'm telling you, it's going to be all right. In fact, I said to her, I said, Mom, like, believe it or not, I'm just like you. Like, you, you gave that to me. Like, you gave me anxiety, right? <laughs> and, and so I have anxiety about new things, too. Like, I have anxiety about fears and about, I mean, like, just certain things. And, and so I said, I'm telling you, like, in my own life, what I've discovered, I told you, what I've discovered is that every time I see a, a fear or a challenge or something that's like, oh, like, go after it. And I've discovered that when I go after it and I accomplish it, it's never, as, it's never as bad on the backside as it is on the front looking at it. And I told her, I said, Mom, it's almost become addictive. Like in my life, it's kind of become addictive. It didn't really help her any, but anyway. <laughs> See, I think our relationship with God will always mean addressing the hard things. It will always mean addressing the hard things. It will always mean a willingness to like look deep to look deep within us and even things that would scare us or things that you would say, man, I don't think he could ever do that. I'm telling you, don't back down from it, but charge towards it because he can do it. Man, if, if you will have the courage to face some of the tough issues in your life, I'm telling you, you'll end up at a place when you'll be looking back at it saying, I can't believe I ever bowed to that. I can't believe I was living with that. That God could actually do a work there. See, there was a passage in this, there was a, a different scripture that came to my attention as I was studying this passage that I've never seen before in connection with it, and it just helped me. It, it was Luke chapter 6, verse 48, so it's a different account of a similar story, right? And it says this, it is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. It's the part I want you to see. See, it's like a person who digs deep. When was the last time that you, you used a shovel and dug a hole? Anyone? It's hard work, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard work. And, and man, a lot of times when you're done, like you, you show the proof of that you used a shovel and you haven't used one in a while. Unless I'm just talking about me, right? <laughs> it's hard work. But see, I love the picture of that. Like that you're getting through the, the mud, you're getting through the topsoil, and you're getting down to bedrock. But see, for us to build... The house on the rock, it means we've got to do the hard work of digging deep. Of digging deep and allowing God to do a deep work in us that is beyond the surface. It's beyond a touch-up job. And that's why even the scripture say, it says that, like, see, when we confess with our mouth and we believe in our hearts that God sent his son and he raised him from the dead, that we're given new life. You know, and so this goes way beyond a remodel. This isn't a remodel of something old. This is something brand new. It's about being all in. And then, and then listen to this. So why is it so important? Why is it so important that God would do a foundational work in your life? Because, I mean, it sounds like, Kevin, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I mean, it sounds like hard stuff and even thinking about things like we thought about last week, like lust and like anger and like, I mean, tough things that I'm trying to address in my life. See, I'll tell you, see, the foundation matters. It, it matters greatly. If you look in Matthew chapter 7, verse 27, when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, and it's talking about the one who didn't apply it. It says it will collapse with a mighty crash. But when I read that, the first thing I notice is just when. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house. You know, um, it doesn't say if they come. It says when they come. As the pastor of a very, what I would call a large church, with lots of different people that come through here every weekend, here's what I see on a regular basis. 
See, like this week, like, like clockwork, it happens every week. Pretty much every week, we hear a story of someone who's in the midst of high winds. Someone who's having a tough time in marriage, someone who's having a tough time with their kids, someone who's been diagnosed with something, something somebody who's really sick, somebody who's struggling emotionally. I mean, like, you, you, you can imagine, right? We always get reports of high winds in people's lives. And, and here's the thing. See, like, I, I, it's not like we can guess who it's going to be this week. It could be any of you. It could be any one of you who life is smooth and sunny and a perfectly calm day. And come Monday, you get a report you weren't expecting. You experience the death of a loved one. You go through a difficult, difficult, like you start of a difficult time, you get difficult news. I mean, it, it, can be, it can be a variety of things, but I'm telling you, it happens every single week. And the question is not if. The question is not if for you. The question is when for you. See, and, and then what this passage says is that when this happens, see, the difference He's talking about foundation. What what matters about foundation, that our foundation is in our relationship with Jesus Christ is because it's the difference between standing and crashing. It's the difference when the winds come of being able to stand or crashing. that's, That's big stuff. You know, if I were to ask you about your house, if someone were to say, hey, tell me about your house. I mean, how many of you would say, your, your first lead-in, I mean, when someone said, man, tell me about your house, tell me all about it, you'd say, well, let me tell you about the foundation. No. No, you'd probably talk about location, right? Location, location, location. You'd talk about maybe color. You would talk about maybe kind of something that sets your house apart. You might even talk about your neighbors, I don't know. But no one is going to go, oh, man, let me just tell you, our foundation's beautiful. You don't do that. The only time you talk about foundation is when something is wrong with it. The only time, even, even this, when, found, when the foundation comes to the surface is when something is wrong. See, storms have a way of revealing the structural integrity of our spiritual foundation. It reveals it. It's, it, I mean, the moment a storm passes through, we see what we're made of. We see where we're at. And here's what I'd say to you. It's never too late to remodel. In fact, it's never too late to build fresh and new. That even if you're here this morning... And you would say, man, I don't think my foundation is good. I want to tell you, like, that's not a bad thing. It's just saying you're in the right place and God knows exactly where you live. And he's challenging to say, get your foundation right with me. There's there's a verse just a little while later. It's actually 633 of Matthew, and it says this. It says, seek the kingdom of God, and above all else, live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. It's a picture that God wants to be absolutely first in your life. And he says, if I'm first in your life, everything else can come second. Everything else becomes a little more trivial. And I'll tell you when that shows up. See, you may think he's first in your life, but it will show up when the winds show up. We need him. We need him. See, the, in the promise, I, there's a verse that I've, I've always liked. It's, out, it's in Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. It's a picture of a God who says, man, when you're in the midst of the storm, when the waters are coming up and the wind is blowing, man, I am close to you. I promise to be close to you. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you promise not that everything will be good, but that you'll be with us in the good and be with us in the bad. 
I'm thankful, Lord, that you are trustworthy. I'm thankful that you love us, that you are for us, that you believe in us and you want the best for us. I'm thankful, Lord, that I know that we can trust you. God, give us the courage not just to be hearers, but doers of what you say. Because God, at the end of the day, when life happens, we need you to be the foundation that holds us steady. I thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.